the throne tonight. We're grateful to you, God, for the opportunity to be in your house again. Lord, we had to cancel a couple services here, Lord, but it's good to be in your house. And so I pray, Father, that you would help me, God, to get out of the way. Lord, it don't matter who's speaking, Father. The people don't come to hear anybody but Jesus Christ speak. And Lord, as time goes by, Father, I realize more and more how important that is. Lord, I'm not here to give a good sermon or to give even a filler sermon, Father, but Lord, we want to bring something, God, that would deposit and feed your sheep and nourish them, Lord, in such an evil day that we live in. I pray, God, that you give us spiritual food in due season now. Lord, we love you and praise you. Be with all those who couldn't be here with a retreat starting, with a minister there. I just pray, God, that you would help them, Lord, as they break the ice. And I just pray, God, that you give everybody traveling mercies. We love you tonight, Lord. All the needs that were brought before your throne, we just ask you one more time, God, to be mindful of them. Every need behind every heart here tonight, every question that they might have, I pray, God, that you would answer it, Lord. I, I put my notes together, God, but Lord, I don't want to be bound by them, Father. Just take my mind, my, my lips, God, down the path that you'd have for your people. We love you now, Father, and we pray as we give everything to you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. God bless you, musicians. And Sister Jeannie, if you have that, um, you could put it up on the screens. Um, if not, we'll just, we'll just roll with it, okay. I sent them stuff last minute trying to be a help and uh, sometimes that can make it worse on them. So, so I'm gonna, I have a lot of scriptures tonight that I wanna read depending on how the Lord leads and so um, don't feel like you have to turn with me to all of them. Um, I'm just, I'm gonna keep rolling and see, see how this goes. So. Just a couple announcements before we open. If you want to be opening to Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter 3 and verse 1. I'll make these announcements. And before it gets too far, my last announcement on here is today is Isaac LaFontaine's birthday. So we want to wish Isaac a happy birthday. He gets overlooked a lot this time of year, being so close to Christmas. Uh, I remember many times at retreat celebrating with Ike and... Uh, Tonight, we had to call on him and say, hey, I know it's your birthday, but we really need you to work. <laughs> Wouldn't be your birthday without that. So thanks, Ike, for jumping in like you are. God bless you. Uh, this Sunday, um, Brother Eli Ortiz will be speaking for us, so uh, come out and support him speaking. We're looking forward to that. And uh, with that, the adult Sunday school class will be canceled. Normally, we have adult and children's Sunday school at 1030. The adult Sunday school is canceled on this Sunday, uh, so we'll pick that up the following. Um, tonight, if there's any kids here, and there are, we have con some construction going on in the back youth hall. Uh, normally, the kids will go back there and play. Um, there's some play sets and things, but because of the construction materials, if the kids can stay in the fellowship hall, that would be helpful um, just to, for their own safety. And we'll try to get that out of there by Sunday so they can go back in there. But um, we do have some construction going on. So if you could work with us on that, we'd appreciate it. Um, today, we, we've been trying to get this out to you. And then with Sunday being canceled, that made it a little difficult. But today's the last day to give to count for your 2022 uh, giving receipt. If you want that to go on 2022, we need you to give that tonight, um, actually, because the deposit goes in in the morning, the bank's closed on Friday, and it goes by that Thursday deposit. So if you uh, wish to do that. All right, so Esther chapter 3 and verse 1. And Sister Jeannie, I tried not to make you work tonight, so I apologize for getting in that in so late. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did give him reverence. If you want to turn over to Hebrews 1, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. If 
Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath pointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That right there proves that Jesus Christ is God himself. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, has he said unto any of the angels, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, has he said to any of the angels, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him, Jesus Christ. And of the angels he said, saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. And I just noticed that today in studying, and it just, uh, just inspires me just now even. We'll bring that out later sometime. Verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? You can have your seats, and I pray that God would bless his word now as we go forward. Hebrews 1 and verse 4 said, Being made so much more better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Sister Jeannie, I can um, text you this later, but my title tonight is Haman the Agagite, the Adversary and Enemy. Haman the Agagite, the Adversary and Enemy. What I'd like to do tonight is... um, there's a lot of types. I've been bringing out different types and shadows and Esther and, and how it relates to our spiritual walk. And I, I didn't anticipate to have another uh, insert into this, but it was just the way things came in studying today. Um, so we'll maybe wrap up next time. But I just, this, this uh, there's something in here that so inspired me that I want to get to a little bit later. But in this, and, and the reason why I'm bringing about uh, Hebrews pulling in Hebrews is because it's talking about the angels and how how Christ was made uh, a little bit later in Hebrews uh, chapter two it says he was made lower than the angels and yet we find in chapter one the scripture says he's more than the angels Jesus Christ was given a greater authority than the angels he was above the angels and the angels were set below him and and we find in, in a lot of types between Satan and himself and, and Haman in the book of Esther. And we know as we've gone on with the story of Esther, how, how that, uh, you're familiar with Esther, how Haman is the uh, arch nemesis of God's people and Queen Esther, how he, he uh, go, brings about this plan to destroy God's people. And that includes the queen, Queen Esther. And so we know how the story goes here, but we just want to bring out a couple things. How um, in, in our opening scripture, it said, it said uh, in Esther chapter 3, how it said um, after these things, after, queen, after Esther became queen, Brother Paul asked in the office one day, we were just talking about Esther, um, I forget who's in there with us, and 
he just, he just asked the question, and I didn't think much about it and, until I was studying this, and he said, I wonder, what, I wonder when Haman became promoted. Was it before Esther or after Esther became queen? And I just thought, well, I wonder where he's going with that. You know, that's, that's a peculiar question, a way to think on it. And, but what I found was is that Esther's granted queen, and then Haman is promoted. So after these things, after our names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life, was, was Lucifer promoted? After our names were written, after Christ died and, and his, his name was written on the book of life over our names and the blood was, was going to be shed, after that plan was in place, then God started creating. Then God created angels. Then he created the heavens. So our, our, our fate of God's people was already sealed up in his book before we even had an enemy. Amen? Amen? Our names were written before the foundation of the world, before Lucifer, an angel, was promoted. And we see that, that Haman is promoted, and, and it goes to great length to say he was promoted above all the princes. He was promoted above, above all his counterparts. And we know that Lucifer, Satan, was promoted above all the angels around him. He was, he was the right hand of God at that time. And, 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 and yet he lusted for more. And Haman is the right hand of the king. The king, it, it, we'll, we'll get to it here in a little bit, gives Haman his seal and he says, you're next to me. Your word is now my word and it cannot be broken. And, and yet we'll find that wasn't good enough for Haman. So we see a lot of these, these characteristics in this story. The book of Esther references many times how Haman wants to destroy the people of God. It doesn't just say he wants to bind them doesn't want to say, he, say that he wants to put them in slavery. It actually says over and over again when it talks about Haman's desire is to destroy, to utterly destroy, to wipe out, to destroy God's people. And Satan, of course, would do that to your life tonight. He would try to inflict a cancer on you or he would try to do something. There's, there's many needs that were brought before us tonight that we want to keep in prayer. And, and some of them, we don't know where they stand with God. And if God... If, if they were to pass on, then we would just have to trust that we've, we've committed them into God's hands. I, I, had a, there was, I was at a funeral one time, and I was just grieved in my spirit, and it was a family member's funeral, and I was just thinking, but I didn't know where they stood. And, and it, was, it was, you know, a priest of, that they had, and, you know, not knowing truth like we know truth, and, and he made a comment, and he said, you know, many times people on their dying deathbed make their heart right with God and will never know it because they can't speak. And, and that, that helped settle my spirit in that moment. That helped bring me some peace. And I just thought, well, I just, I just trust that they did that. And so we just have to trust that. But Satan would try to get to you before you could have that chance. But you remember the thief on the cross as it's been brought out many times. He didn't have much of an opportunity until the end. But he just said, all he said, he didn't say, forgive me, forgive my sins, I, I, can I be let down and baptize me? All he said was, remember me when you're in your kingdom. And Jesus granted him eternal life. So Haman, Haman would want to destroy God's people. Satan would want to destroy us before we could have that opportunity to give our hearts to God. But he doesn't want to just destroy us. He would take your life if he could. Sure, that would be good. But what he wants to do the most is to destroy your spiritual walk, to destroy your relationship with Jesus Christ. And he's put everything in our path today to be able to do that. He's, put, he's, put, he's made the, the internet and, and, and social media is, is probably one of the greatest plagues that we have of today. We have, you know, and you think that, you know, we know that it would be something physical. Brother Branham said there will be plagues that make cancer look like a toothache. But there's plagues today that make cancer look like a toothache, but in a spiritual sense. They make, they make the things that they had to deal with back then look like a toothache compared to what we have available and what Satan has, has uh, conjured up today to destroy us spiritually to get us sidetracked, to get us so distracted that we become into a spiritual death, that we, we, we lose our spiritual strength, that we lose the faith that we need to, to defeat Him in this hour, the, the, that, we, that we lose rapturing faith. Satan is after that. He's, he wants to destroy us. 
But we see, um, now if, it, let's just draw some of these things out. Esther 6. And you know what? I'll just reference these for time's sake tonight. But Esther 6 and, and 6 through 9. No, let's, let's read it. Let's read it. Esther 6, 6. All right. Sister Jeannie's with me. She's doing good. So Haman came in. So this is, this is Haman is, is distraught. He's, I, I think he's, he's put out a decree that the people should bow before Haman whenever he's around. Well, there's one man that won't bow, and his name's Mordecai. And it's driving Haman up a wall. And so Haman, um, I forget what happens just before this, but they're just, they, they, Haman is just beyond mad. He is just ticked at this point. He, he cannot stand Mordecai. He can't stand God's people. He, he wants to be lifted up and, and treated like the king. Mordecai's not doing it. And he's stomping his foot and saying this isn't fair. You know, it sounds like a, a little kid, you know. And that's just what the devil is, is just a little kid. So Haman came in, and so he's, he's out walking. The king can't sleep. The king says, hey, somebody read, read, read my words back to me. And they come across this instance where Mordecai foiled the plan that, was gonna, that those two men that were in the king's court were going to destroy the king. And so the king says, well, what, what was done to him to reward him? And he says, well, there's nothing written here. And so he says, well, what, what can we do? And then they said, well, and he says, well, who's around? And they said, oh, Haman's around. And this picks it up. So Haman came in. He says, go, let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, what shall be done unto a man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to be, to do honor more than to myself? Who in the world would the king want to honor? It has to be me. It has to be me. What pride and selfishness. And Haman answered the king. Now this is him saying, it's got to be me, so I'm going to make it good. I am going to get what I wanted. I, I'm, watch this. Let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most notable princes, that they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street uh, of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. And he's, he's saying, make him like the king. Dress him like the king. Put him on the horse like the king. We know that Satan is, is, is found riding a white horse in Revelations. What's he doing? He wants to be like the king. The king is on a white horse. Let, let me have a white horse. And we know that he changes horses as he goes, but... So he has all of this in his heart, and, and he's, he's saying, King, promote me. So now we want to go over to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. Now that was what Haman's desire was. Now let's look at what Satan's desire is. He says, says Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? He was made the morning star. He was made the angel of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit. And you know you are the stars of God. And we know that over in Revelations, there's stars in the, in the hand, and that's the messengers. And here's Satan that's so bold. I'm going to make my throne. I'm, I'm going to, I will exalt it. God, so God gives him this position, and then he says, I'm going to exalt it. I'm going to make it more than what the king made it. How he ever thought he had the authority to do that, I don't know. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Let's stop right there. Satan's great plan, he, he lays it out. The Bible exposes it. Now we know what Satan's after. Now we know what Satan's trying to do. Now we know that Satan is trying to, to rule over us. 
And His only purpose is to destroy us. His only purpose is to have dominion over you. And, and He can only have what God allows. So, so He'll bring everything about so that us and our free moral agency, we make choices. We, we get presented with choices every day. Do we, choose, do we choose the Lord's side or do we choose the enemy's side? And I, and I regret to say, oftentimes, I do, we all do, we make the wrong choice. And Satan presents that and he says, ha, I got him. Ha, you know, and, and we've heard it before. He's the one, he'll tempt you and then he'll call the police on you. He'll say, hey, buddy, here, here's this. Go look at this. And then he'll say, ha, I gotcha. And then he'll go before God and he'll say, hey, did you see what he did? He didn't say, hey, did you see what I did? He says, hey, do you see what he did? Do you see how he fell to that? Do you see the decision that he just made? So, we see the desire to be like the Most High. Now, Esther, and I'll just reference these. Back in Esther 3, we find that, just, just typing Satan and, and, and Haman now, we find that Haman's, Haman's princes, the ones that are under him, and just, just for typing's sake, I'm going to say Haman's demons, tell him, hey, we can't affect God's people. There's, there's, there's a man that is not bowing to you. And when we talked to him, we asked him, why won't you bow? And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. And they said, well, please, just, just bow to him. It'll make it easier for all of us. And he said, but he won't bow. We, we tried. We tried to persuade him. We tried, to, we tried to, to, to let him have it. We tried to tell him, you have to bow, and he still won't do it. And the end of verse 5 says, Haman was full of wrath. And when you won't bow to Satan's devices, he gets angry. And he says, okay, tells his demons, if you can't do it, then I'm going to have to do it. And so then he comes down and he wars against us. Verse 6 says, so when, when, when Haman's devils couldn't get God's people to fall, Haman went himself, and where does he go? He goes straight to the king. The only source he could go to before he could touch the people, the king's people, the king's subjects. Before he could do anything more, he had to go to the king for permission. Haman accuses God's people before the king. And it's interesting because you can read in Ezra and different books around Esther, and these men are saying, you know what, king, these Jews, they're nasty. They're nasty people. They have their own laws. They don't regard the king's laws. They're peaceable. They're not causing any trouble. But they're not doing they're not going the direction of, remember last time we talked about the spirit on that nation, they're not going in that direction. They're, 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 they're withstanding the evil age and, and the, the demons can't handle that. I don't know what to do with them. I don't, I don't know what to do with Wesley. I don't know what to do with Henry and Sharon. I don't know what to do with the different ones. He names you by name, the demons do. And Satan says, well, I'm going to have to go myself. If you can't do it, I'll go. But I'm so glad tonight that when, when, when the angels couldn't do it, when nobody else would fit the bill, Jesus Christ, God Himself said, you know what? This isn't a job for you. It's a job for me. I'm going myself. I'm going to go myself. Haman, he comes and he asks permission. Later again, he comes and he asks for permission. Uh, to do something to God's chosen. Now, let me just see here because I had this written down wrong. So I just want to catch this. Chapter 3, verse 10. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, do with them as it seemeth good to thee. So this is Haman. He's, he's come to the king. He's expressed, I need your permission. There's a people out there. They're just nasty. They're nasty people. And the king says, okay, here's your permission. Now go over to Job chapter 1 with me. Job chapter 1. And we'll, we'll, we can let Sister Jeannie put it up. Verse 6. 
Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewest evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Now in each, throughout the history of the Bible, each of the kings that were set over the Israelites when they had went into bondage, I think except for, well, even with the Babylonians, at some point, the, the, the children of God found favor with that king. But there was always somebody that was, that was trying, to, trying to put blame and fault on them. Always somebody coming before the king and accusing them. But they, were always, they always were given favor with those kings. Verse 11, but put, forth, uh, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Pull up Job 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Nasty fella. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and is true as evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity. Now watch this. Now God's going to brag on him. Say, so you tried. You, you considered him. I'm just asking, kind of, it's almost like a mockery, you know. Hey, Satan, we've had this conversation before, but have you considered my servant Job? Have you heard about Job? He says, and still, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, you did. You did consider him. Still he holds fast his integrity. Although thou move, uh, movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin, Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So, when, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. This is, this is that, that coming before the presence, and, we, and we've heard these things before. But I bring it to your remembrance again and, and type it in with Haman. He had to go before the king. Satan has to go before the king before you can have a trial. Satan has to go before the king before you can get sick. Satan has to go before the king before somebody in your life could pass away. Satan has to go before the king before he can do anything to you. So we draw these similarities between Haman Queen Esther and the Jews' adversary, and Satan, the bride, through the ages' adversary. It's always been, he's always been the adversary. You, you, do, you don't have a new adversary. This is the same adversary that the people of God have been fighting throughout all the ages. Even in our story of Esther, this was Satan behind this. He was driving these spirits behind. Remember, we brought out in Daniel, the prince of Persia. It was, it was the spirit that was on that nation that was warring against the saints. And, and, but there's a spiritual battle, as we brought out the last time. There's a spiritual battle. And, and in that spiritual battle, there's, there's angels that they're, they're battling and they're warring against, but they, the angels of darkness will not overcome the angels of light. Because you remember, there was a... There, uh, uh, I believe it was Michael gets called in, who is, who is Christ. He gets called in, and he starts, he starts warring with the prince of Persia so that this angel, this messenger, could get to Daniel. And he tells Daniel, I heard your prayer from day one. I heard your prayer from day one. So that from day one, when, you, when your request 
even becomes on your mind because your, your, your thoughts speak louder in heaven than, than even your words. But then when you speak it in prayer, from that time on, God is on the case. God is on the case. The angels are working for you. They're working to get to you. They're working to bring you your deliverance. They're working to bring you your healing. But it's this adversary that, that we're up against. Now I want to follow because it, it, the Scripture is, 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 is um, so specific to say Haman the Agagite. And so I just I got curious one day and I said, well, okay, so what's the big deal about an Agagite? And, and you know, we've said it before and I, and I learned it and, and uh, it was the, the sight and sound story of Esther's kind of started me down this path. Um, really good, great job. But in that, they give some history. And they said they had the, the Agagite. And, and they start giving the history of how Haman is an Agagite, which comes from um, Emelech. And, they, and that's the king that Saul was supposed to destroy. And he didn't. And he, he spared his life. And so Amalek's uh, lineage continues on, and here it is rising up again against Israel. And now I, I just want to bring this back. So, so the Agagite lineage we find in Genesis comes from Esau. Esau has a son, and his name is Amalek. Then over in Exodus 17, verse 8 to 14, um, we're doing good on time, so let's, let's go there. Exodus 17. In verse 8, so Israel's come out of Egypt, they've come out of bondage, they've come out of the world, and then their battles don't stop there. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out. Fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand at the top of the hill with a rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and uh, Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they went and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Moses' hands are outstretched, and as long as they're outstretched, Jesus' hands were outstretched and nailed to the cross, so they stayed that way. So we have our victory. As long as they were outstretched, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword, and the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I want to stop right there because I want to come back to this. So you see how Emelech, I mean, they're just, they're right out of, the, out of, out of Egypt. They, they come across the Red Sea. They're, they're on their way to the Promised Land. And here comes this nasty fella. And he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna try to tear them up. He's going to try to destroy them. Now, Schofield makes a note on Amalek, and, and I just thought this was good, so bear with me while I read this. Amalek was born after the flesh and progenitor of the Amalekites, Israel's persistent enemy, is a type of the flesh and the believer. So watch this now. Watch this type. Scripture's specific to say Haman the Agagite. When you go all this back, Agagite, Amalek, is a type of the flesh and the believer. He that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. But the conflict with Amalek in chapter 17 sets forth the resources of the man under law rather than those of the believer under grace. If you go read Romans 7, you'll find, you'll find this starting to be discussed, and, and Paul does a beautiful job at explaining this. Sets forth the resources of the man under the law rather than those... Uh, of the believer under grace. Paul says over there in Romans 7, he says, he says, I didn't know sin except for it was by the law. So the law came and then, and then it was like sin came with it. And he said, it's not that the law is bad. He said, I wouldn't have known that I was sinning except for it was by the law. But then man can become so bound by the law that, that 
he, he operates under law and, and does away with grace. The man under law could fight and pray. He could fight in Joshua. He could, he could pray. Under grace, the Holy Spirit gains the victory over the flesh in the believer's half. Amen. Amen. Now Romans 8, uh, Sister Jeannie, if you could pull that up. Romans 8, verse 2. I told you I had a lot of scriptures tonight, but I hope I'm not losing you. Romans 8 and verse 2, and we're just going to go to 4, so don't let me go past it. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, it, it didn't give you any overcoming power. It just told you you were wrong. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns Him in the flesh. Amen. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. There's a righteousness in the law. But it, it couldn't be done, it couldn't be fulfilled in us without Christ who walked not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, Sister Jeannie, Galatians 5, 16-17. And in, in Romans uh, back in, in chapter 7, you find Paul is, that's where Paul's saying, I, I, I constantly, I want to do good, but every time I try to do good, evil's with me. And, and that which I don't want to do, that I find myself doing. But I think it's so beautiful this week as I went there, and, and I found that Paul actually says, Never, it's, it's, it's no longer I, because of this sin and because of the law, because of this law of sin and death that's working in my flesh, he says it's no longer me when my desire is to do good and evil is present with me. It's not I in the eyes of God that's doing the sin. It's sin itself that's doing the sin. So he says in God's eyes, I'm no longer to blame when I sin. It's not me doing it. It's the sinful flesh that's doing it. So, so maybe I'm not saying that just right because I got more excited than what you're giving me right now. <laughs> He's saying in God's eyes, when you do wrong, it's not you doing the wrong. It's not you anymore. It's, it's sin that's doing it. It's sin gets the blame. It's Satan that gets the blame. Because Satan introduced sin into, into, in the garden, amen? And so it's no longer you. When you sin, when you do wrong, we beat ourselves up. Satan calls the, calls the police on us. He goes before God and he's, he's, giving, he's giving his... His, his input to God, his accusation against us. He says, hey, you know, look what he just did. But God says, no, no, he just repented. That's not him, that's sin doing that. And sin will always be with us in this flesh. Sin, it's just, it's the cockleber nature. And, there's, and, and even though there's a wheat gets put in that, it's still cockleber on the outside and it's sticky. And I hate it. Galatians 5, 16 and verse 17. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so ye cannot do the things that ye would. So your desire is there. Your hunger is there. Your thirst is there. God, I don't, I don't want to do this thing anymore. I don't want to be bad. I don't want to do evil. And yet, there's something in you that's always, that's always drawing you to it. And it's the flesh. It's not you. It's the flesh. It's Satan always there to tempt you, to always bring this thing, to always work on the flesh. Because the flesh is not converted. It's the sinful nature of the flesh is not converted. It's not controlled by the Spirit except you give submission to the Spirit and your, your flesh comes under subjection. And that's through the power of the Holy Ghost. So you can have dominion over your flesh, but it's what do you submit to. And if you're walking after the flesh, it, the flesh lusts against the Spirit. So we have to be in the Word. We have to, you, you have to come to church. Listen, this isn't, you don't have to come to church for attendance. So, so you can mark down in a book. You don't have to come to church to pay your tithes. We don't need your tithes. We, we, you should pay them, but we don't need them. What we need for you to do is to come to church so you can be spiritually refreshed, so you can continually walk after the Spirit and have dominion over the flesh. 
Because the spirit and the flesh are constantly in war against each other. And then Schofield ends, he says, but this victory is only as the believer walks in the spirit. Acting in independency or, or in, in, I'm sorry, I don't know that I can pronounce that right now. Independence or disobedience. Emelech, the flesh, gains an, in, uh, an easy victory. So when we act in independence or in disobedience against the Spirit, Emelech, the flesh, gains an easy victory. Now watch this. I'm just going to make reference to this. And this, this is just some things that have opened up. And I don't know how to fit them in or when, but Numbers, and I'm not claiming to have any great revelation, okay? It just opened up to me. It's things we know we're blessed people, but it's, it's what's opened up to me. Numbers 14, um, 42 to 45 is, is uh, 14 is Kadesh Barnea. And the, the children of the Lord reject the Word of God. And, they, and, they, and they, they look at their own self. They look at their, they're comparing their flesh. They're looking at the flesh and they say, we can't do it. They're, they're, the this, this spiritual en enemy is greater than we are. We can't win. And, but God said, that's your land. Go take it. Before you take it, I'll tell you what, go get some fruit from the land. It'll encourage your faith. But when they come back, they say, oh, we can't do it. They're looking at their flesh. Oh, I can't do it. I can't live a Christian walk. I can't, I can't make it. Satan's always beaten up on me. I'm always defeated. I always walk in defeat. I'm always falling to sin. I'm always falling to the same thing in my life. And I just want to make new mistakes. And, and it's just, just something new. Sometime would be great. Because this thing just seems, I keep falling. My flesh is too weak. I can't make it. Lord, why did you choose me in the first place? Kadesh Barnea. They wake up the next morning after, after they've rejected the Word of God, after, after God's judgment has come forward, and they say, hey, Moses, we're going to go defeat the Amalekites. They're just, they're just up on the mountain. We're going to go fight them. We're going to avenge our sin. You'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll show them. We'll, we'll gain our victory back. We'll earn our way into the promised land. That's all coming fresh, by the way. I didn't expect to say any of that. Moses tells them, if you go up, you're going to be a defeated people. God is telling you not to go. You would think that they would learn. Okay, We just rejected the Word of God. We just had judgment passed upon us. Let's, let's follow the Word of the Lord. Moses says, don't go. God's not with you. You will fall if you go up. And they say, we got to earn our way, Moses. We're going up. They go up. They fall because they reject God's word again. They go up and they lose. And this, this brings up the point. When we lay down the word to fulfill our fleshly desires, because, now this is a quote now, you, you have to lay down the word before you can sin. You have to lay down God's word before you can sin. And James said, what's drawing you to that is, is the lust of the flesh. And we'll lose every time. When you lay down the Word, you'll lose every time. When you lay down the Word, you automatically choose to go Satan's way. And you'll, you'll come away feeling defeated. You'll come away with your spiritual faith hindered. But I just want to read a couple more scriptures. Sister Jeannie, are you still with me? Okay, she's doing great. Let's give her a hand. Deuteronomy 33.28, Sister Jeannie. This is the word of the Lord that's over you. If I wrote these down right. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heaven shall drop down dew. So this is, if I'm remembering right, in these scriptures, sorry, Sister Jeannie, I'm going to have to turn there because I think there's some good stuff here. I believe that this is when Moses is going off the scene and he starts blessing Israel. Yeah. Chapter 33, 
chapter 33 and verse 1. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, The Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of his saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive thy words. That's the word of the Lord over you. That's the end. Uh, that's, that's your end. That's the end of this journey for you. 33:28. And this is, this is, you know, we've, they've come through fighting Amalek. They've, they've come through these things. Israel then shall dwell in the safety alone. The fountain of Jacob shall be upon a land of corn and wine. Also his heaven shall drop down dew. Isaiah 40, verse 26 and 31. Isaiah 40, verse 26 and 31. Let me make sure I got that right. I don't think I do. Oh, I'm not in the right spot in my Bible, that's why. <laughs> Sorry, Sister Jeannie, I just got to see it to make sure I won't catch everything I want. That's verse 25. To whom then will ye liken me or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One. 26. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by name, by the greatness of His might, for that He is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed from my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, feigneth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The, going back to Hebrews, if you continue on in Hebrews, remember I said he was given charge over the angels. He was, he was, he was, although he came and he was below the angels, yet he was above them in power because it was God in flesh, Jesus Christ. And, and, and Paul goes on to write that you are heirs to that. You are heirs, and, and there's different scriptures in Ephesians, and I think over in Galatians, it says everything was placed underneath his feet. So even though he was lower than the angels, even though technically when he came in flesh, he was lower than Lucifer because, he, because Lucifer was an angel, yet it was God in flesh, and when he died and his hands were, were stuck to that cross outstretched, they were, they were nailed so they stayed up. It gave you and I the victory over the angels. It says that all things are put under His feet. And then in, in, in another spot, if it don't say it outright, I think it does, but if it doesn't, you can gather from it. If you're heirs to that, that everything is under the feet of Jesus Christ, and you're heirs to it, then everything is under your feet, including the angels. Amen. Amen. So this is the Word of the Lord over you. This is the Word of the Lord. Now, uh, if I can catch these... and and. We're doing good on time. Are you still with me? Yes. Amen. Sister Jeannie, um, Numbers 24, verse 4. And I, I hope I got in here what I wanted. Verse 4, we're going to verse 9. He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance. So this is, this is um, Balaam. But having his eyes open... How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. I want you to remember, Amalek represents the flesh. As the valleys are, they spread forth as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lean, lean aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his bucket, and his seed shall be in many waters, and his king shall be higher than Agag. Agag is the king of Am Am uh, the Amalekites, and his kingdom shall be exalted. 
God brought for him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. Verse 9, he, he couched, he lay down as a lion and as a great lion who shall stir him up. Blessed is he that blesseth thee and curseth he that curseth thee. Let's go to Exodus, back to Exodus 17, verse 15 and 16. Oh, she's fast. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it uh, Jehovah, uh, sorry, Jehovah Nisi. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And I, th I think that's it. So the Lord's going to have war with Amalek. Um, let's catch one more. Deuteronomy 15, 17 to 19. Deuteronomy 15. Then thou shalt take an awl and thrust it. Uh, let's see, I think I got that wrong. Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 19, sorry. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt. How he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou hast, uh, was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about. This is what I wanted. Amalek's the flesh. And, it, and he said that it'll, it'll constantly be warring with you. But here it is. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. That's what Jesus Christ purchased that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. Amalek, your flesh, one day, the remembrance of it is going to be blotted out. We war against Amalek. We war against the flesh every day. We, we hate it. We strive. We, we want to do right. We can't seem to do right. And yet one day, the remembrance of your flesh is going to be blotted out from under heaven. Amen. Amen. You can stand to your feet, and I'm just, I'm just going to bring this down to a close. Esther 6, verse 13 and 14. Haman is, is distraught, and he's furious. Haman told Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends everything that had befallen him. Then said his wise men and Zeresh's wife unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews... If, if this people sitting here tonight and who listen to this later, if they be the seed of, of, of Jesus Christ, before whom thou hast begun to fall, thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. So even here, Haman, type of Satan, He's done all this. He's getting furious with this people. He's getting furious with the people of God. We, we get furious with the flesh. We get furious fighting the enemy. And yet, his own people, Haman's own people said, you, you're trying to make them fall, but you're actually going to be the one that falls. That's, that's the end of Satan. Every attempt to destroy and accuse God's people to the king that Haman tried backfired on him. And the king's queen and God's people were exalted. When it came down to the end, the enemy's life was held in the queen's hand. And everything the enemy tried to do to God's people was actually done to him instead. You remember, he built the gallows and he said, make them as high as you can. And then he was the one that was hung on them. We know that over in Revelations and, and other places in the Bible, we find the end we find our adversary. We've read about our adversary, but yet over in Revelations, he's cast into the pit and, and he won't bother us anymore. Oh, the day, amen? Oh, the day. Let me read you a couple quotes real quick. Musicians can come. If the church has been judged and they have judged themselves and have accepted the blood, how can God judge a man that's perfectly, totally sinless? 
You say there's no such a person. Every born-again believer, true believer, is perfectly, absolutely sinless before God. He is not trusting in his own works in the blood of Jesus that his confession has dropped into. The Bible says so. See, he that is born of God does not commit sin, for he cannot sin. Remember, when you're, when you're under the blood, when, you, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, it's no longer you. It's sin that does it. It's sin that gets the blame. That's why it says in, in the next, oh, right, right in uh, uh, the next verse, start of, of Romans chapter 8, it says, now that there is therefore, therefore, Brother Paul has always told us, go see what the therefore is there for. It's everything in chapter 7 that we've been discussing is, is the flesh and warring and different things. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. How can you make a man a sinner when the bleach of the blood of Jesus Christ is between him and God that would scatter sin till there wouldn't be anything left of it? See, how can that pure blood of Christ ever let a sin pass there? He cannot. He cannot. That's the Word of the Lord over you. You are the pure, virtuous, sinless bride of the Son of the living God. Every man and woman that's born of the Spirit of God and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and believes every word of God stands as though you, have sin, you, you never sinned at the first place. You are perfect. The blood of Jesus Christ. How can you if a man... If I was supposed to die in the morning, a man took my place. I cannot die for that sin. Somebody took my place. And Jesus, the Word, took my place. He became me, that a sinner, that I might become Him the Word. Amen. Let me hold true to it, not the church, the Word. Amen. Oh, that spiritual union of Christ and His church now, when the flesh is becoming Word and the Word is becoming flesh manifested, vindicated, just what the Bible said would happen in this day, it's happening day by day. Amen. Um, Brother Michael, you can play something soft. Let me just make sure. I, I might want to stop there, but I, I do have one more possibly. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I'm excited. Seven golden candlesticks. In Exodus 25, 31, it says, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knops, and his flowers shall be of the same. The true church of Jesus Christ, the bride, is likened to pure gold. Her righteousness is His righteousness. Her attributes are His own glorious attributes. Her identity is found in Him. I don't deserve this. What He is, she is to reflect. What He has, she is to manifest. There is no fault in her. She is all glorious within and without. From beginning to ending, she is the work of her Lord, and all His works are perfect. In fact, in her is summed up and manifested the eternal wisdom and purpose of God. How can one fathom it? How can one understand it? Though we cannot do that, we can accept it by faith. For God hath spoken it. And when I was listening to a message, and maybe we'll bring out more sometime, but those last words just ring. Though we cannot do that, we can accept it by faith, for God has spoken it. We've been given another chance at Kadesh Barnea. We've been given another chance. The Word of the Lord has been spoken over you. The Word of the Lord, it's not, it's not a physical land now, it's a spiritual land. This is the Word of the Lord that's been spoken over us in this generation. It's been breathed over us. Let's not fail to believe it. Let's not fail to take Him at His Word. And I believe He has grace. I believe more and more as time goes by that this is all grace. I believe it more and more. And it's things like this that just make me want to stop and praise Him for a little while cry for a little while because I, I'm, I'm not there. I don't deserve it. I, I make 
choices every day, the wrong choices, and I wish I could take them back, and I can't. But it's His grace, and this is, this is, it doesn't make sense. It don't seem fair. But He knew it wasn't fair. And this is the word of the Lord over you.